um, directed organization. So it's those ministers of health which tell us what to do. More emphasis on this, less next year on that, and we try to implement that. But at the same time, there's a dual passageway of communication between and the ministers of health around the world. Seven by seven, 24 by 24, millions of data that we can hardly digest anymore. I come to that during our session. And therefore, we help the ministers of health to set the agenda. So it sounds a little bit contradictory, maybe. We tell them what to focus on, and in turn, they tell us what to focus on. But it works very effectively, and that is part of our mandate. Keep the world informed and to open the corridors of communication between governments. That's the main role of WHO. We are not sleeves rolled on applied medical interventionists. For that, I often say, if you are interested in that kind of career, the Red Cross or other NGOs directly involved in the medical assistance field, in refugee camps, in areas where people have seen disaster struck or whatever. But WHO's main role is to be the facilitator and the convener behind the scenes. As you have seen in Ebola in Western Africa 15 years ago, recently with um, the pandemic, with SARS, with AIDS, with anything you can imagine, None of today's health challenges stops at any border. Um, it's just uh, the borders are artificially man-made, but the disease, any disease, doesn't give, doesn't care. Sorry for my English. I stopped the sentence here. And um, that's why we and our role is primarily to make government other to find united the effort to control the disease to what comes in totally wiping it out or at least to um, alleviate the challenges posed by all these diseases so to summarize it and that is all of my we are the political convener, so to speak. Strictly speaking, we are, of course, neutral, we are diplomatic, we are non-political, we don't take sides, except the side of um, medical intervention on, on health issues, but otherwise we are not bound by any belief, by any uh, alliances or something. We are in broker between the nations to address the issues at stake. Now, for some, that may look a little bit disappointing or maybe even complex at the beginning, but that's the challenge of and the beauty of working in an organization like this, where it is very diversified in terms of challenges faced and very challenging in terms of political arena in which we operate. So I come to that later when we address the issue of who we are looking for. And that is by no means just doctors. We'll get there in a few minutes. So allow me now to go to the slideshow. But as an um, upfront remark, please interrupt me at any given moment. Please, please, please do so. With questions, with comments, with uh, requests to repeat, whatever it is. Because not seeing you or the majority of you, just four or five pictures on my screen here, I don't know if anybody of you falling asleep in the back bench or starting to play with a mobile phone all the time. So I don't know if what I say here is in any way relevant to what you want to know from us this afternoon. Now to my slideshow. Um, I have this slideshow since many years. It follows a certain standard pattern of information. It is primarily intended to keep me on track. And probably I break off after 10-15 minutes of talk in order to open question and answer session. 
um, you will receive, all of you, the slideshow at the end of the day, because I will um, mail it to Francis as a coordinator of this group. And I will attach to it also something that is very useful, we found out, that is a daily changing vacancy notice of the entire UN vacancy board. I just checked it about an hour ago. You get the link to it. And today, this afternoon, it stands at 1,664 vacancies. Open vacancies that can be applied to. Of course, from the beginner's level to the senior director level, it has it all in various organizations. But it gives everybody who has access to it a very interesting perspective on where are the commonalities of the UN organizations, where are possible differences, and what attracts me, what looks promising, what is where I could see myself working in this context, or rather not. My slideshow to start with, um, where does the screen, what is all this? Maybe this is my screen here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I start, keep on going here. It, I hope you can see it. Can you? Yeah, you can see it's clear. Perfect. Good. Yeah. So it's called Working for WHO. Before I say anything more, I invite all of you to think much uh, 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 in a larger context. Um, I have spent the last quarter of a century, I'm already that old, yeah, I can't believe that, uh, more than 26 years, in various organizations of the UN Common System, three different organizations in three continents, in seven duty stations, so I've seen a little bit of the UN, and my last job before I came to Geneva was a global HR policy position in the UN Secretariat in New York, and from that angle I dare to say the similarities between all the organizations in respect of hiring, human resources policy, advertisement, and what is ever related to it is much greater than any difference between these organizations. Which say, once you end, always you end, so more or less. Where there are differences, I will specify them. But otherwise, extrapolate whatever I say here and think larger. Also from a different perspective, you are all students of health technical specializations according to the website of your university. But still many times people think of health in the UN, that's WHO, full stop, end of the story. And this is absolutely wrong. While we are the lead health agency focused on public health, we are by no means the only one with a significant health program inside the UN common system of 25 organizations. A couple of these are self-explanatory. I started my career in the Philippines when I was there an exchange student in high school times. And um, uh, just a few weeks ago, I read an article in a newspaper of the biggest refugee camp currently around the world, that is in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, 650,000 people. I'm a German, so from a German mm -hmm. context, a city of 650,000 is, I don't know what, like in Ghana, maybe a sizable city by all means. Now that's a refugee camp. You can just start to imagine the health challenges faced from getting water and sanitation to um, simple hospital facilities. People are born there, people die there, people are getting sick there, the hygienic conditions are often a challenge, not just there, but in any refugee situation. To make it short, you can imagine the challenges faced in addressing these related issues. So, WHO works together with UNHCR, like with many other agencies, on health-related programs. So, think larger, think the only one with a significant health program. Um, FAO, to give you another example, the Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome, uh, we are very closely working together, not just since the last epidemic. Um, just think of zoonosis, the jumping of disease from animal to mankind. Anything of the big pandemics in the last quarter of a century or longer has been coming that way. Be it AIDS coming from monkeys, be it uh, Ebola from, from bats being the 
current epidemic, still open from, from where, probably also from bats. And you can continue, and we will unfortunately probably continue. So cooperation between these two agencies is very intense. ILO, across the street, the International Labour Organization, across the street from our headquarters, here 50 meters away. We work with them on issues of health, um, healthy workplaces, uh, health at the workplace, and anything that's related to that. And here I stop. Just to give you an example of once you work on a health issue, you have probably all the major agencies with a smaller or often larger program involved in it. I leave aside UNICEF and the global vaccination campaign, but I really stop here. Now, that's a beauty also of working for WHO in the health area or for any other a health program in the other agencies because, this is my first message that makes work so interesting, you never work alone. We don't normally have what they call in the Western jargon a nerd, a person sitting over a microscope in the basement of some, I don't know, research lab uh, for days in a row and, and no, we don't have that. A, because I come back to what I said initially, we are the facilitator if we need additional scientific data, we get it from our collaborating centers, more than a thousand around the world, which are typically universities, research institutions, think tanks, this kind of thing, non-for-profit usually, where we know we get the data if we need it. So we do not have that kind of thing. We are, as I said, a facilitator, yet, we work together with all the other agencies in addressing the health challenge on a holistic basis from any angle that is required. Um, that's the beauty of working for this organization because you do not work alone. You work always in teams, multidisciplinary, inside the organization and far beyond. You work with almost all other UN agencies depending on the challenge faced. You work with governments, you work with NGOs, you work with non-for-profit organizations, you work with uh, solidarity funds, you name it, you have it, and that makes life, work life, so much more interesting than if I imagine myself now working for a company. Nothing against that, I always had a fight with my father. My father is like a very German, of course, never left the country, but he's like in his mentality, like a, he was, he's not that, like a Japanese. Yeah, he started to work for a company and never changed until um, he passed his days, married to the work. And at the end of the day, I didn't want to tell him directly what was the outcome. He made somebody else, the owner of the company, more rich. So that's the next message I give to everybody, um, and I hope that we can discuss it around that line if it is of interest to you. Before you ever think of going into global public health on a non-for-profit organization, you have to do your homework first. Is that the stuff that I really want? That's a career I can see myself in? For example, if you are proud to see your name under academic achievements, you published an article, you have this or that. And maybe WHO or the UN isn't the optimal place for you to work because whatever you do here is not published under your name. Very rarely it is WHO's uh, intellectual property. If you, are here for the, if you are looking for a job to make money, serious money, I mean, yeah? Maybe you're not well placed here either. The UN pays very well, competitive around the world. But if you're really in for the mega bucks, no, you don't get rich in the UN. You get satisfied. That's what I can guarantee. So to end this here as an introductory remark, think big, think larger. We are the lead agency for health, but we work with almost all the others. And that's where it makes it more interesting, also from a different perspective. Once you start in any of the 25 UN agencies, it is relatively easy to switch. That is how I drove, drove my career over the years. I had the pleasure to work for three different organizations. Each time I changed, it came with a little bit of an upgrade, a moving career, more interesting job. 
And I always asked, why did they hire me, these other guys? And to be quite frank, I think the old slogan applies, the grass always looks greener on the other side. So not knowing me, they may have hired me, and that was for my benefit. But I can tell you, this is a very common feature throughout the UN, and that's a positive one, because it allows for an interagency fertilization process. We bring best practice from the other agencies, we get new ideas, we face new challenges, and we get around the world. And that is what it is the most interesting aspect of our work. Here in Geneva, we have two and a half thousand staff. Globally, we have eight and a half thousand staff on the payroll. And in the UN common system, we have around 120,000 people on the payroll. Now, you can just start to imagine how versatile and uh, globally oriented the workforce is. You never, as I said, work alone. We never work in a team like me uh, with five other Germans. Could be interesting, but let's be honest, it would probably be boring at the end of the day. Working in constantly changing teams makes life never boring. Sometimes it's a challenge. I think, oh my God, why do we do this this way? Can't we do it the German or Japanese way? But then, of course, that's my limited um, flexibility at the very day when I find out that at the end of the day, the intervention from our colleague from Ghana or from Eritrea or from Bolivia or from any other place was so ingenious I would have never gotten that idea. That's the beauty again of working for a global workforce like us in the UN. Now let me go on to the, I can skip all this, you know all that, uh, blah blah blah, I already covered that. Um, 150 country offices as um, uh, Doreen mentioned already six regional offices. So this is where I've stopped the slideshow. And don't worry, no need to write down anything. You get the slideshow by the end of the day. And uh, when the TV program is boring, you look through the self-explanatory slides on your own pleasure. Now, this is the only thing that differentiates WHO from the other UN agencies. And that is important in terms of possibility to apply for a position. Because here we have regionally elected um, offices. Um, no other agency, to my knowledge, has that. I worked with UNHCR, the refugee agency before, headquarters also here in Geneva, a kilometer from here. And like all the others, it's very pyramidical. The high commissioner is at the top, and then it filters down from Geneva to any country office or sub-office at the end of, I don't know, obscure countries that you hardly find on the map. Now, in WHO, it is very decentralized. And the regions, six of them, are basically mini headquarters. Each of them has around three to 450, 500 people working in it. So they're already a small headquarters in its own right. But their role is, um, you know, the constitution is they are elected by the member states. They have their own money and they have their own authority to hire and fire. Now we don't fire, luckily, or very rarely we have to only when really criminal activities come into play or total misfit in terms of... Now, that's so rare, so we, let's focus on the hiring. Um, headquarters in Geneva doesn't get involved if in Manila somebody wants to hire somebody for a post or in Brazzaville for another post. But here are a few tips I would like to share with you if you're really interested in a future career. If you do it strategically, First of all, this structure allows you to apply simultaneously. You can apply for a position that attracts you in Geneva at the same time. You can apply for a position that attracts you in Brazzaville or anywhere in the Afro region that is covered by the Brazzaville office, and you see it by the color most of the continent. But, here's the big but, WHO strives for an internationally diversified workforce in any respect, be it nationality, um, uh, ethnical background, languages, uh, orientation of lifestyle, whatever have you, we want the variety in the workforce as is reflected in the world in reality. Now we are not really there. We made a lot of advances in gender parity. We reached almost every level 50-50, not so in the management level, but you are mostly beginners, so that's where we did well. in that region. No understanding about the culture in the Middle East and Northern Africa, no knowledge of Arabic language. 
So what value? But if I look at Manila, that's an office where I'm very familiar with. I spent 10 years as a schoolboy, as a student later on in China, as uh, my first jobs, 10 years in Southeast Asia, predominantly English speaking, familiar with the culture and the um, region. So I would probably have some chances if I would want today to apply for a post in Manila at my level, I would be considered. Now, strategically speaking, if you want to apply, apply outside of your home context. I would call it outside of your comfort zone, outside of your continent, if you still want. Because that would add a bit of cultural variety. Copenhagen, now the regional office for Europe. Germany is a very important country there. Because it contributes a lot of money, it uh, has some political influence, it calls the shots this way or the other, and no surprise, Copenhagen office full of Germans. Um, it shouldn't be that way. And at the end of the day, don't get me wrong, it is not primarily the distribution of nationality. This is a factor among many others to be considered, but it is the qualification of the applicant. Now it says in English, all being equal, comma, then, da, 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 then we go for gender and nationality and so on. So, um, statistically, I would say um, any German or English man no need to apply currently because overrepresented by gender and by nationality, but still feel invited to do so because at the end, as I said, it is the qualification that governs. Um, don't worry, I watch my time here, and as I have the tendency to talk and talk and talk, nobody stops me here, I shall limit myself to another three, four minutes, and then I stop myself. Now, um, here we come directly already at career opportunities, and then it gets a bit technical uh, in terms of how to apply, how does an interview work, what to consider in writing an application letter. We can cover that in the question and answer session if you want, or I can continue with the slideshow, but normally I stop after this image here already. Now it starts when I talk about careers with the internship program. I have to smile because sometimes when people come in real life to our office, which opened again after COVID, student groups come, and I start with this, I see it in the faces already of the people in the auditorium saying, what is he talking about? internship. I already have my bachelor's degree, maybe my master's degree in my pocket. I'm writing on my PhD internship would be selling myself on the price. But think twice or more. Internship program is actually a fantastic door opener to get first impressions on the UN uh, work, the work done by the various UN agencies. Um, our own uh, uh, recruitment figures tell us that statistically a very high number of people that apply for positions with us have been an intern at one time or another either with us or with another agency for that matter it doesn't really matter for that sake it doesn't really matter whether that internship was with WHO with UNAIDS with refugee agency with the ILO or any of the other 23 UN organizations because especially for the beginners we want to see if a person was able, interested and able to perform a non-for-profit organizational context in another country, ideally, uh, on the various UN covered subjects. And that is the beauty again of the working for the UN. You have the Millennium Goals and any of these Millennium Goals is covered by a specialized agency. Be it human rights, be it refugees, be it uh, health, of course, very dominantly, uh, SDG 3, um, be it uh, environment, and more to say. So, for us, at beginner's level, internship, it counts the same. Now, when I saw this photo, taken um, summer before COVID struck, after that we stopped the internship program for two and a half years, now it's running again, um, this photo was taken. And when I saw the photo, I immediately felt like, hmm, very happy to look at it, happy DG in the middle of happy interns in Geneva, but something struck me right away. I don't know if you can see it, if resolution is good enough at your end, but I immediately felt like predominantly white faces and predominantly female. 
no, no problem. I would be uh, happy to be an intern again. In brackets, I had two internships. Um, not with WHO, but with other agencies. But the point here being, and Tedros, Dr. Tedros picked up on that, saying, wait a minute, who are these people? I put it more simply, who are people, interns, able to come for six months to Geneva and pay their life in, let me be undiplomatic, the most godforsaken expensive place on earth? Apparently, we are not number one anymore, but I heard uh, Geneva is only number eight on the most expensive cities around the world, but, but that's what it is. So, DG Tetros got a brilliant idea and said, I take the internship program under my own patronage and I find funding for it. And here are the good news. Um, the first good news is we resumed the internship program. The second good news is we are the second only agency in the UN history that pays its interns. We don't call it a salary because the aim is not to make anybody rich on this, but to break the cycle of having the effect, as you see on the photo, that only people from, let's say, rich kids from rich countries can come and afford here six months in Geneva. So we started with a stipend. Of course, it will be on your mind how much is it, and the answer is around 1,560 US per month, which may sound a lot of money depending on where you are, but mind you, in Geneva, it just gets you around the corner. But that's the aim of it to get you around so that the intern can focus on why they're here in the first place, to focus on the work of the internship, and not to run around trying to find where the next lunch is or the uh, place to sleep or something. To sum it up, internship program has a couple of benefits to it. It comes with a stipend so that people can focus six months on what it is, minimum three, maximum six. It also comes with a voucher for a daily lunch, in brackets. I heard always a sentence in English, there's nothing like a free lunch, but apparently there is, at least in WHO for the interns, because you get a voucher for each uh, working day of $14 something, which is the price for a meal in our canteen, so that's why I never go and eat at the table. And here it comes really hefty. It comes with a comprehensive health insurance. This is worse for me to building. So the health insurance is one of the best, even for me as a uh, long-term staff member. It's, it's globally competitive and it does a lot of uh, difference. So in a nutshell, here I say again the same message to you now, and then I really stop talking, that I said when I showed you the map. Think about it strategically. Internships are learning curves for new beginners. You all know the catch-22, as I call it. You want to apply for a job, and the job requires two or three years minimum experience, and nobody is willing to give you this experience, and you say, how can I get out of this cycle? Now, this is precisely the idea of the internship program, to offer you an opportunity to get your hands on real work and learn. Sometimes it may be a fantastic experience for you. I've also seen interns who left in despair or in disappointment at least, saying WHO was too big or too uh, bureaucratic or too slow or probably all of it is probably all true. But I remember one of these interns telling me this when he left. I said, it was a smile. I bet we see each other again in a few years' time. And that's very often the case because... Once you do an intern with WHO or any of the other, you get infected by what I call the international virus. Um, uh, it makes life so interesting that once you return to your, I don't know, computer job in, in uh, northern German province town, there's something amiss here, and that is the global work environment. Now, um, for that sake, we take internships valuable from any other organization as well, even beyond the UN, if it was with Amnesty International or Medicine Sans Frontières or the Red Cross, Red Crescent, all the same value for us. What we want to see here is, is the person fit to endure stress, unpredictability, um, uncertainty, and if so, maybe in an environment completely outside of his or her own uh, environment? These are important indicators for us for future success. Ask me what we are looking for. 
So I come now, I finish here, and I come now to a couple of bullet points uh, in order to stimulate the discussion. Some are on languages. Is it really necessary that uh, I heard that you need uh, French as well, and of course English, or another language? Not really. Ask me for details. Not really anymore. And that's good news. Um, PhD. WHO is full of doctors or something like this. Do I need a PhD in order to have a career? The answer is no. And BA is a legitimate entry requirement. Ask more questions on that. Next, I heard WHO is health lead agency, so probably full of doctors, nurses, and what have you. I'm a finance investment specialist, or I'm a communication uh, guru. Is there space for me as well? The brief answer is, we probably have half of our staff of 8,500 in health technical areas. That means the other half is required in order to keep the show going. So. As long as your background is halfway legal, meaning no tobacco, no weapons dealing, no, no sorts of things, with a bit of smile, uh, as long as it is registered, you are in it. Because if not in WHO, you find a counterpart with your background anywhere else in the UN system, I bet on that. People often ask, how about working for the UN when you have to transfer from country to country? How is it with family, if I have kids or something? Well, the UN has developed fantastic programs over 60 years of doing it, which take care of all these things. Ask more. But, but now I open the floor just here. Um, the rest is for you to ask and to guide me on what you may want to know in more detail. If you don't want to use the camera, which would be better for me because then I see you, then you can write a chat. I see there are 10 chat messages, but when I moderate the session, I don't have normally time to read the chat. So if Francis or anybody else would read out a pertinent chat to me, that would be helpful. Otherwise, take the mic, take the camera if you want or not, and ask the question. Anything Thank you, you very much, much for your presentation. There's some questions here. But I think you answered them already. They are talking about a particular field, like prosthetics. Those who are into uh, rehabilitation of physical disabilities, uh, are they able to apply for the internship? And also you have for public health. So maybe it's people with different background, especially in public health or Prosthetic and orthotics. Do you have opportunity for internship at the WHO? That's a question in the chat room. I hope that I got it because acoustically it was a couple of times interrupted. But there was an issue of handicap, if I got it right, and of public health. Public and health, yeah. 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 Um, I would almost say the majority of interns, and here you see the picture of 520 back then, 600 later, that's a sizable number around the world. Um, the majority was not public health. They came from all sorts of life. Because as I mentioned, we cover all areas of intervention. I myself, I studied psychology. I was a very bad psychology student. Then I started to study medicine. And then in the end, I broke off with medicine because I got an offer from UNHDR. A little bit to my regret, I never ever for one minute in any of the agencies where I work in that area. Because when you then come, you come with a certain experience and maybe language skills and what have you, and so suddenly the organization decides, well, we may need this person rather in this program than here. So very often you start on a certain pathway, maybe linked to your studies, not necessarily, but then most likely in the course of anybody's career, it may change over years and you may find yourself not working in that area that you studied. And very often, most often, in the agreement with the incumbent, not against the decision of the incumbent. So don't worry that you are suddenly being picked out or picked out of your area of, I don't know, pediatrician specialization and you're put into administration like myself. That doesn't happen, but you normally would agree to this. Now, um, if I acoustically heard it on, on handicap or something, 
if that was yeah. indeed the question. Yes, we do have a very decisive programs in which we favor application of handicapped people. Now we have handicapped um, in many respects. We have blind people working for us with the modern assistance that office structure today can offer. We have people in wheelchairs. We have people, uh, I mean, a lot of um, disabilities, but we do have um, a preferential consideration for handicapped people. Again, everything being equal, as I said before, looking at your qualification first, we then find somebody, let's say from an underdeveloped country or with a handicap, that would then be a strong force for consideration. And that applies for internship as well as for normal position. Let me add one more point, aside from your question on internships. As I said before, with a map, Try to play it strategically. Uh, if you are interested in an internship position, they are published like vacancies for real jobs. At the end of my slideshow that I will share with everybody of you, you will find the link to the internship program. And there you find the published things. You, published, uh, you apply against a published vacancy. Now, um, try to go global. Try to do your internship outside of your home environment, your comfort zone. Because you can hit one fly, uh, three flies with one hit, as we say in Germany. Uh, in German, um, you first of all get work experience in a very challenging way that you would not normally have gotten otherwise. B. We are going now next month in May for global mobility of staff. We never had that in 75 years of history, but we are starting now. UNHCR had that for 50 years, meaning that staff are expected to go and move on from job to job every four, five, six years, depending on where your skills are required. Now, keep in mind that the majority of people up to now are sitting here in Geneva or in Manila or Brazzaville or something. Life is that. I don't blame anybody. You have a mortgage, you have a house, you have a family, you have a dog, everything that keeps you there and comfortably so. So going from Geneva to Laos or to New Guinea or to Vietnam or I don't know where, not to mention any countries, or, yeah, is not most attractive for some who have been here a long time. Now, if you come and say, well, I did six months with WHO or another agency is building up a program in this or that, a simple thing, in Cameroon or in Bolivia or anywhere in Nicaragua, you suddenly have a very different perspective here. People look at you and say, wow, this person has really been around. And a strong predictor is, if you endure that and all the frustration that comes with it, to be honest, then you know what you're up to when you apply again. And that is for us a great filter mechanism. You learn by being an intern. We also learn by observing the interns because we do talent spotting. Very often I have a colleague that, now I'm alone in the team, a team of one person only. But I had a colleague, and we were always looking at interns and say, God, have you seen this one or that one? There is a lot of potential. And very often we were not surprised to see that person two or three years later on a real job. Um, so we, we, we notice that as well. But again, um, here is the third point of advantage. If you go to a smaller office or to a country office, you learn more. If you do an internship like these happy people here behind Tetros on the picture, 500 of them or so in Geneva during that year, you are small fish in a big aquarium, two and a half thousand people on this campus. That can be uh, daunting or even uh, causing anxiety. Uh, you are maybe um, isolated as a little intern. Not really, but I mean, it could feel like this. Whereas when you do an internship in a small country office, you learn by doing. There is no question asked, do you do this or that? You are just thrown into it. i give you an example. I was an intern myself twice. Once during my school year in the Philippines when I stopped, uh, skipped school and worked for an NGO in a refugee camp. Much more interesting than school in the Philippines. So, um, nothing at the Philippines but uh, in their school system, but so exciting. Now, that being so excited, two years into my studies in psychology in Germany, I found an advertisement by UNHCR to work in the very same refugee camp where I was an intern for an NGO. And now this time they offered a consultancy ship with a nice two and a half thousand dollar salary. And I said, wow, that's it. 
paid by Germany, the whole program. I said, bingo, this is my job, without even thinking. And I applied for it and never heard from them. Keep that in mind. You have to have endurance, patience, and resilience, and never take no for an answer because it has nothing to do with you. I didn't hear. I wrote again. No reply. I tried to call them. Phone. Nobody knew what I was talking about. So finally, southern Germany, my university, not too far away from Geneva, I took that thing from the blackboard, the old poster, went into my car, drove four and a half hours to Geneva and parked in front of the building. Guard came out and said, no, no, you cannot park here in French. And I say, no, no, nix French. Although I understood, yeah. So the guy was so desperate, he looked for the first German speaker. And this lady came out and said, why are you here? What do you do here? And I said, well, here, yeah, this is it. I applied for this thing here. Oh, my God, you should have written. I said three times. You should have called. I said four times. Okay, so sorry, no more money. Uh, program already stopped. Sorry for that. The Piggly UN, even today, keep that in mind. Nothing ever to do with you. And she said, I have 20 minutes uh, till the next meeting. Come quickly, let's have a coffee. Why are you here? And so I talked about the Philippines, the refugee camp, and so she got interested. And I said, sorry to hear, but... Um, Another idea, no job available, uh, consultancy no more, but if you want, can have another internship. I said, okay, but there's nothing. Where? In Singapore. I said, great, never been to Singapore before. Yeah, sounds fantastic. So off I went. A three people office, three people. But before I went, 20 minutes coffee in her office, we were just finished. I got up, her boss came in. Now, uh, this is Ghana, I know what I'm talking about now. And this is a re real story. Her boss came in and had a question to her. Uh, and then she looked at him and said, look, uh, I want you to meet uh, Hans, our new staff member. And I said, huh, staff? We talked about an internship, now I'm confused. And he smiled and asked anything and said, what's your name? Hans, clapped on my shoulder with this smile like here. He said, well, one time you and always you and welcome. And years later, my suspicion was always there. I found out from that lady who it was. Um, Kofi Annan. He was an intermediate specialist of admin and finance in UNHCR at that time. Now, here I go. Because I came to the smallest country office that UNHCR ever had, Singapore. Three international people. One Swiss, one Indian boss, and myself as an intern and eight local staff. That's it. And I was so exposed to the world in that small office like I could not have imagined anywhere else. This is just a message. If you are in a small country office, you probably learn more. The intensity of the learning curve is much steeper. And the satisfaction, I dare to say, of what you do is greater because you see the impact of what you do, positively and negatively. Mistakes happen, that's fine. It happens everywhere, but you learn out of it. Whereas in Geneva, you sit in a committee, you write guidelines, you look into whatever. So just my recommendation here again, play it strategically, apply for internships in a country you would have never in your life thought about because that's where it gets exciting. Thank you very much, Hans, for your clarification on that point. You have other questions concerning the qualification. Do you have any minimum qualification to be intern at WHO? And also, do you have funding? Thank you. Uh, qualification for interns is slightly different than from positions. I start with the internship. The only qualification that you need is to be applied, uh, to be enrolled, sorry, at a university. And, uh, or you may have finished university for no more than six months because it's really geared towards students. So not to people who are ready with one leg or two in the labor force. Um, that's about the only conditions that we have. Being in university, being enrolled, or not out longer than two years. Minimum, I said three months, maximum six. Um, the stipend is payable depending on the purchase power at the country all around the world. In Geneva, it's 1,500 something per month. So in Laos, which is a very cheap country uh, in terms of expenditure, um, that stipend rate would be considerably less, but the intention is so that it takes care for all your financial needs. There is no other prerequisite linked to the internship program, but as I said, not unlike my time as UNHCR Singapore, you cannot just fix it between me and, and you. 
these days everything is channeled, you have to apply, and the link at the end of the slide show gets you to the internship program. Now, next associate question is requirement for applying for posts. Now here all the UN agencies that I'm aware of, and I visited most all of them, um, are applying the same thing very strictly, and that is the minimum of two years of work experience. For a beginner's job, it's one exception, I'll come to it in a minute. Beginner's job normally starts with a two-year relevant work experience. Now, these two years can be combined. It can be three months here, six months there, internship for WHO counts, for the other agency maybe not necessarily, so better clarify whether it counts or not, um, but three conditions only. And that is, it must be proven, so there must be a contract or thing like that that you sign. It must have been paid, and we don't care for the level of the payment. Of course, in, in some countries you earn a friction of what you would earn in Switzerland, so it's not the level, it is just an indication for us that it was a meaningful, serious eight-hour job. If it wasn't eight hours, but let's say you did it half-time, then half-time counts half, so four years of half-time makes two years of full-time. Two years minimum of experience combined in whatever form you want, relevant to the job, is the minimum requirement, plus a bachelor's degree. Linked to the qualification of the language skills, in many cases the vacancy notice always these days say English is a must, you're from Ghana, so English is a mother tongue, you're perfect in it, and an asset would be another of the six, uh, of the then five remaining official languages, Arabic, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, and uh, French. There is much more flexibility today than there was 25 years ago when I joined, and at that time I didn't speak any French. I almost didn't get my job because of that. But at the end, it is a qualification that counted more than anything else. So they told me after the interview, yeah, you have to improve your French. I said, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yes, in the evening, weekend courses and so on. And as a joke, later on, I found out that there was no deadline to it. So I said, okay. I soon retire, so I need some project for retirement, so I will finally learn French. Now, there's a kind of joke, but it tells you things are not always eaten as hot as they are cooked. Um, I want not to underestimate the importance of languages. In fact, as an HR professional here in my own organization, I sincerely believe in it and I support it. But again, if you have the skills, if you have the background, if you have the emotional power you want to do this and you think that you can then i would say very rarely is the language skill the killer of the interview unless of course the post demands it if you apply as a communication officer in geneva then of course language is an issue i'm an administrative specialist in entitlements and salaries 100 percent of the work takes place in english talking about which geneva environment being in francophone switzerland is 100% English spoken. Maybe you can use some French in the cafeteria. That's it. Um, so, did I answer all the questions on qualifications? Yeah, thank you very much for your answers. You have another question concerning the work experience. Uh, is it necessary in an organization or any health related facilities before joining WHO as work experience? And I already brought this across between the lines like half an hour ago when a little bit here and there, um, but maybe it got drowned. No, keep in mind that uh, we have about half of our staff some with some health technical specialization. Now that could range from psychology to biology to chemistry to pharmacy to ophthalmologists to applied physicians, medical, uh, public health, what have you. But that also means that the other half is combined of almost any background you can think of. And very often it's not so much the academic uh, degree what you have achieved, but it is the combination of various building blocks of a future career. I said that very early on when Doreen was still there listening to us to the beginning of the day. Um, what is it then that we are looking at? And to start with, we do not look at grades. 
we take it for granted that when you come from an accredited university like yours is or mine was or something, meaning those things with, which you find in obscure internet things where you send money and you get a degree, that of course is, is disregarded here. But if you come from such a university, if you take it for granted that you know what you claim to know. So spare me as a selection interviewer with all that kind of information that you had a fantastic degree of 1.2 in, and you were the second fastest in your academic year. How do I relate to that? I don't even know what a 1.2 would be in Ghana or if you have that kind of system. So again, um, very often I get applications which emphasize overly academic achievements. This is not really what we are looking for. But then is these building blocks that I mentioned, it's a combination of the baseline, which is your study. You studied anything, let's say public health, fine, good, uh, taken for granted, you know some basic here. And then what? And I would call it social soft skills tested by real life. You have been out of your comfort zone. You have been to another country. You have been in an environment which was not necessarily of your planning. You prevailed or you had your doubts, but you reflected on them. So more diversified, especially in the early years, your background is, especially in an international context, so more interesting for us. Unusual language skills are interesting for us. In my time, 25 years ago, a German would know German, a little bit of English. My English was so bad, I can't believe it. And um, that was it. But today, looking at the new generation in Germany, many have, I don't know what, parents speak Kiswahili or one parent speaks Vietnamese or something. It's very interesting for us because uh, we never know where the next bugger strikes. Although this is not one of the six official languages, somebody then with a background in public health and maybe communication skills because he or she was the editor of the student magazine or something of that sort plus foundation in Vietnamese language bingo that makes suddenly a very interesting combination that if needed you don't find anywhere so we do keep this kind of things on record um, what we see very often as the predictor for possible future endurance is that you did, I said an internship thing, you could have done something else, where we think, what prompted this person to leave the academic pathway that they embarked on and suddenly do something so unusual? I don't mean taking your backpack and uh, hitchhiking through the United States for three months, that can be challenging as well and interesting, but that's not so much uh, what I mean here, but work-related. What prompted this person to suddenly change direction 180 degrees? What did prompt the person to take a sabbatical uh, year off at a very early stage? Normally that comes to age 45 or something. Yeah? But why did the person at age 23 decide to do totally different? And we have had that. I remember uh, in my HR department, we had what I call the senior intern. He was 53 years old, the oldest intern that I've ever seen. But he was enrolled in university, and the background was at age 50, maybe wife died or divorced, I forgot the details. He completely rearranged life. He went back to university, studied public health, and that was interesting. This person had so much of accumulated work experience and life experience that he was suddenly very interesting for us. So it is this kind of combination at the beginner's level. Now it changes, of course, very much when you apply, I'd say, at age 40 to a mid-level career position, which is much more specialized then. Then we are really looking for your qualification, maybe publications in the area of disease control, of um, highly pathogen uh, um, um, disease spreading or something like that. Then we do at the beginner's level. Because we know, and everybody has been in the same situation like myself, that at the beginner's level, you are swimming. You don't know, you don't have the experience. And how can you? So, beauty for us is you can be shaped, you can be trained, you can be directed. Therefore, back to the minimum. Two years minimum, bachelor's degree minimum, and English perfect must. This is basically it. So more linked to public health or health-related, so better. But many of our colleagues don't have 
any link to public health or health in any way or form. Thank you very much. So because of the diversity of the WHO, uh, another question is how competitive is the internship application? How competitive is the application? Very much so. Um, maybe not necessarily now, or maybe even worse now than um, uh, before COVID. I do not really know. Um, the numbers of internships are still very low in a few dozens, uh, I heard, not in the hundreds as we had before COVID. Every department is now waking up and saying, okay, okay, I also need again. Um, it is competitive, um, but keep in mind, as I said before, if you approach it strategically, you may not necessarily want to come to Geneva. People think Geneva is the greatest place to network, to build your future career. Occasionally it may be, but occasionally I also heard that it's very lonely here in this big environment. Now, you apply to an internship position on the same footing like you apply for a position with dozens or hundreds of competitors. Now, when it is an internship in the Department of Human Resources where I am, I am in the sub-department, the unit of talent acquisition. That means we do interviews and so on, yeah? We do selections and so on. If you would then say um, in your university course you had a specialized course in this one, or you have been working as a volunteer on the selection panel of I don't know what in your university context, these kind of things are getting suddenly very interesting for us. Any connection to the outline of the internship post are interesting but i can also tell you that i've seen interns who were doing the internship and didn't really have a predisposition for the area maybe they were the only applicant at that time or um, the post was located in another duty station that wasn't seen to be attractive in brackets for me anything outside of geneva or the main offices is so much more attractive than geneva close of brackets then chances increase. I would say the chances are probably lowest in Geneva um, because of the high competition. But frankly, I don't know the current numbers because we started the internship program only in November and now it is March, April. So not really picked up yet. Go and apply. And again, I said um, at the beginning, I say, share with you the vacancy notice board. Some of these 1,600 as of today, are internships. I looked at it. So, uh, other agencies, not necessarily WHO, look at them, open them, see what they require in that agency, where's the emphasis, and maybe you suddenly see the differences between, slight differences between the agencies, and you find this or that more attractive, or that duty station more attractive. Um, by doing so, not under time pressure to say, I must have an internship by July because then I'm breaking it. That hardly ever works. That leads me to another point that I mentioned in between the lines. I only can re-emphasize five times over. Never, ever, ever take no as a personal um, answer. If you don't hear from us, it is not because you are not good enough. It is because we don't have enough workforce to even remotely reply to any mail we get leading to the next don't ever write unsolicited unsolicited uh, application letters we get so many of them probably by the dozens every day yeah they start all the same ever since i was a child i was attracted by the mandate of un blah 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 no need because no need uh, nobody has time to read it or to retain it or to uh, reply to it out of the question so everything in the UN, not with us only, but with any other agency, only works against published vacancies, internship or posts. Now, here next tip, one leading to the next. Be short. At one point, you will be required to write a motivation letter. I've seen so many motivation letters over the years. My absolute, utter belief and tip for you, therefore, is keep it short. If you take only one message today out of this session, and that is keep it short, then this is the key message here. 
because I've seen so many where people then try to write the novel of their life, even though they are 22 years of age. But mind you, my life can be very full of experience, unlike my province boy here. But spare it. And keep in mind that the average HR officer, sorry to be so blunt here, has an average of 90 seconds per application length. 90 seconds, one and a half minutes. So we skim it through. Keep in mind when we review a P2 or 3 admin office, a very generalist thing, beginner's level, we get sometimes thousands of applications. Somebody has to start to read all that. Now, skimming through is very fast. In or out, in or out, based on a very few parameters. But at one point, we need to go into a serious um, um, reading because our we have groups, we have companies to do the pre-reading and so on. Once we reach 20, 30, 40 meaningful applications, then it comes to the selecting manager. Now, even if I only get 20, I'm also only a human being. And we have our recording system and we give points and everything is balanced and transparent and can be justified. But at the end of the day, I get tired. And if in the evening I read application number 13, do I still remember what applicant number seven has said? I should so. And on my papers, help me. But if I go home in the evening from my office in Geneva to the village in France where I stay, 20 minutes by car, and I keep in mind the name of Francis, who sent me this unusual application, very interesting, very short, very down to the point, where I have one or two questions, now then you made it very far. So my recommendation would be pin it all down to three, four maximum bullet points of what is your unique selling point. That could be academic, but no more than one sentence on this. That could be in terms of life experience, no more than two sentences on this. A motivation letter of two pages is easy to write. One page is much more difficult to write. If you can pin it down to less than half a page, that's a skill but a skill that pays off because I cannot memorize more than three, four bullet points per person and nobody else can. So if you can sell yourself to me as a reader with three, four, maximum five individual aspects of why you think you fit the vacancy, that's great. Now, that is not always, as I said, linked to academic achievements. In fact, leave it away. It's a waste of space and time. Your time to write it, my time to read it. All the, every letter sets in. I was so much attracted by this vacancy notice that I saw yesterday in the media, of, and, and I would be grateful if you could review, blah, blah, blah. Of course you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't apply. So spare that space and spare that time. Come down to the fa basics. I read it, and here are my three points why I think I could be an essay. One, two, three, A, B, C. Now, very few people get that stringency. It is difficult. Uh, I mean, I can easily talk about it if I would need to apply again. Would I be better? I'm not sure. But try it that way. Because that distinguishes you from the vast majority of applications that we see. Yeah, thank you very much. Do you have any fund to cover the flight ticket for those who want to do internship? Uh, say it again. For interest, do they have cost of funding to cover the flight ticket? The flight ticket for those. Yes, 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 yes. Um, in the stipend, um, and the good news is the stipend came from outside of WHO's regular budget. So the DG was very uh, creative and smart and find um, sponsors for the stipend outside of the budget, which was appreciated by the donor countries. Yes, that applies to flight financing where there is need. Now, not everybody coming from a low uh, or least developed country automatically is a low, uh, least um, um, affluent person. There can be variations as everywhere in life around the world. But if you make a credible case and say that you cannot otherwise come because you know, other then we don't ask many questions, we believe you. Um, and yes, there would be a co-sponsoring of transport costs, yes. And in fact, when COVID struck, it was interesting because many people had uh, return tickets, but they 
um, disintegrated because airlines didn't fly anymore and became extremely expensive to transport those interns that were stuck in Geneva then back to home countries. Extremely expensive. We are talking thousands of dollars here for a one-way ticket. WHO found the way to pay it all. So at the end of the day, yes, I'm happy to say that there is provision for that as well. Although we first expect the interns to be able to finance out of own means, and where there is none, we jump in. Thank you very much. What happened to the school activities like school work when the student is on internship? You mean the relevance of a, a school project for an internship application? Is that the question? No, it's like what's happened to the school work while the student is on internship program? Oh, school work. You mean student work? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. But the minimum is three months, as I said before. The maximum is six. So anywhere in between with three months. I did my internship in Singapore that I mentioned four months. So I didn't even ask my university for anything. I just left two weeks early, came two weeks late, nobody noticed. Uh, so it can be squeezed into a semester break in many universities. Or you ask the university to ask for one semester sabbatical. I mean, depending on the country, I really don't know the details, but often university administration is flexible here and says, okay, then you stop basically for six months and you resume after you return. That I've seen very often is the case. But we don't, we don't intervene. We don't write to universities in that case. Yeah. So we would issue at maximum a letter saying you've been expected, accepted for an internship of six months in Geneva, let's say, and and if that is helpful to get a sabbatical leave from your university, that's it. But we do not normally engage in a discussion beyond that point. So it's up to the student to to figure it out. Thank you very much for that clarification. Side aspect, have... uh, interesting side aspect uh, that comes to my mind from that aspect. Um, it's not the first time that an intern was then inspired by the internship experience to feed it in into the final thesis of university degree. So uh, to, to design a study along that line or to start data gathering in this area something which the intern would have never had before. In a way, not directly, I did the same. So having studied psychology and then being an intern in a refugee camp, I suddenly started to think of how about cross-cultural differences and psychological concepts, and I made it into the final thesis of my studies. So um, th th that is not to be underestimated. So it's not just a loss of time when you so think, could also be an investment already at that time into the future. Yeah, that's very interesting. You yourself, you work in different countries and maybe some of the uh, cultural perspective, cultural backgrounds is challenging. So how do you deal with different people with different cultures? How do I work with different people? Yeah, different people with different cultures. Yeah. Because the, Traveling across countries and continents, you meet different people with different background, culture. So, how do you deal with them? Well, for me, um, it's what I find most interesting about the job altogether. That's very clear. Um, without that, life, uh, work life would be much more boring, to say it quite honestly. But to also be honest, um, I had seven assignments in different countries, and while I was there, it was not always easy. Uh, language-wise, culturally, and so on. And to be honest, so if you would turn back the clock 22 years and call me up spontaneously on a given Thursday afternoon, I would have probably complained about something, that organization being too, too slow, too bureaucratic, to something, the country too hot, the people too unfriendly, too direct, too non-direct, very difficult to understand, blah, 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 what have you, normal. Once I left the country, all of them, I look back and say, well, actually, I miss it. There was not a single assignment, which today I look back and say, that was a waste of time. None. None whatsoever. And they have been very different. In fact, uh, my most interesting assignment was in New York City, in the Secretariat of the UN. I didn't want to go there, but I decided strategically, because UNHCR has a four-year mobility thing. 
so exhausting. Every three, four years, I have to pack luggage and move on. And I wanted to break that cycle, and I went to New York, and it was an open-ended position. And I didn't, uh, at the time, Germany and the Iraq war and what have you, and blah, 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 and I didn't uh, look forward to it. And it was a most stunning, interesting assignment of all times. Because New York is also a very interesting melting pot of cultures. I remember having been at the border of Laos, that's why I always mention Laos, in Thailand, northeast Thailand, very lonely, the only foreigner at a refugee camp and then 15 local staff. No word of Thai. So I needed for everything that I needed to do a translator, very exhaustive. And did I understand the fine-tuning of the culture, the, the way Thai people want to communicate? No. Um, nothing dramatic happened, no disaster took place, but I felt so lost. Today I look back and I can't get enough of holidays in Thailand, if I ever can afford and have the time, because I find it so attractive and interesting. I wouldn't want to miss that, none of the others. But your work is always in English, no matter where you are. If you're dealing with a target population, you may have interpreters in a refugee camp, in a WHO office, in any constellation. Um, some agencies, if your assignment is for three or four years, they give you a crash course in the language skill. But for me, Thailand assignment on the Mekong was for two years, so office thought no need even to start with language courses, which was after two years I wouldn't have managed anyway. So that was frustrating. Um, but again, uh, I would never have gone, not even as a tourist, to that part of the world because it didn't look attractive and out of the traveler scale. I'm so glad that with the UN I was able to spend time there. And another aspect, people often ask, when you are assigned around the world, not only the cultural differences, but how about danger? How about war? How about, I don't know, uh, um, a sub-office in Kaputnistan at the border to Idiotistan? or something, yeah, uh, nothing against the Stan country, sorry, I uh, should be diplomatic here, but some places on earth are rather where nobody wants to go. Again, you are not forced against your will to such places. If you come with a family, they want to make sure that your kids find an international school. So with a family, you wouldn't be uh, assigned now to the sub-office of Herat in southern Afghanistan. Nothing against that country, I've been once, and it is most fascinating. But uh, we all, of course, approach life with a common sense, and therefore, uh, we have, I had a, a female Japanese colleague, a lady, uh, and she wanted to go to Herat in southern Afghanistan during the Taliban time. And I was thinking, oh my God, are you aware of what you are applying to? And I met her later, and she said it was a very difficult, but most fascinating assignment of her life. Because it's safe, the UN takes good care of its people, and the country was, um, despite all the reputation, a rather stable time back then. And she said it was easy to negotiate, it was easy with translators to get the message across. And surprisingly for her, they, she, she, said, she said she was respected even as a female single woman working in such an environment. So just to tell you the total extremes between my comfortable New York assignment, which was intellectually challenging, and that daring Japanese UNHCR colleague who went alone to Herat. Um, the world has anything in between these extremes, and that makes life again so interesting. Thank you very much. We have another question here. Uh, which time of the year is application for the internship program open? Uh, to my knowledge, all around the year, because it depends on which office has an opening for internship. It is this way. We ask headquarters, our unit, my unit where I work, asks the departments and the country offices, here we go, do you need an intern? Many of these places never heard about internship. We tell them, look, there's financing here. All that you need is to have a person, can be a helping hand, is a learner, needs very little um, care, uh, should be self and independent, but can be an asset. So some of them wake up and say, yeah, actually, this or that time of the year, Six months, send us anybody if you have. So then we may find, depending on the 